when you're a priest, one of the tasks that you often have is confession. The, so to speak, the other side of confession, but the receiving end, or more precisely, um, transmitting end. And you talk to many people, all kinds of people, about um, preparing for confession. Although in practice, more than talk, you listen. But people come asking for advice, they want to know, for example, how to prepare for confession. And especially if, lately, for example, there have been quite a few people in the kind of late summer period who, who wanted to do their first confession. Because they, have, they were, for example, becoming Catholic um, as adults. And uh, one of the things that you do as part of it is your first confession. And it is a very beautiful thing. The topic for meditation is not confession itself, but that preparation, which we also know as examination of conscience. Examination of conscience, of course, is something broader, something more general than just preparing for confession. But in a sense, confession is like the culmination of that process. And I wanted to begin by reading a beautiful description, it's quite brief, about what it really is about. Many spiritual authors have compared the soul to a shuttered and closed room. As the window is opened and light comes flooding in, its imperfections, its disorders and dirt, everything shabby and broken, becomes visible. In the examination, with the help of grace, we get to know the state we are in, that is to say, how we are in God's eyes. Now, I want to qualify that a little bit, because there is, of course, a big um, lack there. There's something lacking there. When, with the help of God's grace, we are able to look inside, so to speak, and to realize all, or at least some of the main imperfections that we have, our, our sins, it is true that somehow we are seeing things more objective, like more like in the way that God sees us. But of course, God doesn't see only that part. He doesn't see only that which is in this order, dirty, shabby, or broken. God also sees the positive things, which we may fail to see in that moment. Nevertheless, the comparison is beautiful. That God's grace working in our soul, especially in examination of conscience, is like opening the windows of our soul. And of course the main effect of opening the windows of our soul to God's grace is light coming in, air coming in, maybe the air previously was kind of a, what's the word, stale, kind of not fresh. And suddenly there comes this, oh, you can breathe really well then. It's pleasant. That joy of life is awakened in our soul. Examination of conscience is a challenge for us. We may see it as something mainly negative or a burden. Oh, why do I always have the same defects, same sins, same problems? And I want, 
in this meditation, I want to propose a different point of view. That is something positive, something beautiful, something that we should desire. Just like if we would enter a room that has been closed and gathering dirt and gathering bad air, that we have desire. Yes, light, coming light, coming clean air, so that it's good to live here. Of course, the effect of examination of conscience, especially when combined with the grace of the sacrament of confession, is precisely that then it's more pleasant to live there, for us to live in our soul, to us live in our own life, because there's that joy and light and light. But also, we might say that it's pleasant for God to live there. Because, Lord, you want to live in my heart, in me. Even, I can say, you want to live in my body. It's a bit funny thing to say, but nevertheless, that is our faith. St. Paul writes, that you are temples of the Holy Spirit. It means that our very bodily constitution is meant in God's plan to be a dwelling place, a place for God to stay in, to live in. So Jesus, how can I facilitate it? How can I make my life and my soul and, so to speak, my body in its totality, my being, a pleasant place for you to live in. Well, especially, I can facilitate that with the examination of conscience, opening my soul, allowing the light of your grace to come in and to clean. But you're asking me also to participate in the cleaning job. And just like in physical cleaning, we have a room or a house, well, we have to keep clean it many times. When I was a child, we, well, the fact is that in our family, no one really especially liked cleaning. And uh, <laughs> my mother, especially in those times, she had been very much influenced by, and I don't say this in a bad way, she would be the first one to talk about it, uh, that she had been very much influenced by the 1970s feminism that a woman cannot like, have roles that others don't have and so on so so she firmly denied declined to clean the house on her own <laughs> and the consequence was that well we only cleaned together <laughs> the whole, the whole family. more or less once in a month or once every two months <laughs> which was <laughs> not very often and it was here the positive side of it was that uh, we as children, we were four boys, uh, so I'm very inclined to, to, to cleaning things either. Uh, we all participated and we learned to, to take care of some cleaning jobs. Uh, the other positive side was that you could really appreciate the difference. <laughs> after, after one or two months of... Uh, of uh, accumulated uh, dirt. It was uh, such a joy to see the house after the week. And my father had a great pedagogical idea because he was he wanted us to always to remember that cleaning day, as it was called, uh, as something positive. So normally we wouldn't go to restaurant because we were very kind of modest, uh, of a family of modest means. But um, but on that day we would always go to some restaurant, mm -hmm. like Chinese restaurant or a hamburger place or something that the boys would <laughs> like. And so we would always like, wow, wonderful. Clean the day comes, we can go to the restaurant. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, so what you learn with physical cleaning or house cleaning is that you have to keep doing it many times, not once in your life, but regularly. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us that in the spiritual life, we need something similar. And God, what a beautiful thing it is that you, we are like the children of the family that 
like when I was a child, we would participate, we would not be able to, we would not have been able to clean the house on our own, but we were able to do some things that our father and mother indicated us, helped us, guided us to do. Jesus, in my spiritual life, in my interior life, I also want to learn to clean my house, to clean my room, that room of my soul better. Maybe I'm already used to it and maybe maybe the next step is simply to take good care of it, maybe to kind of fine tune the cleaning. But if you it might be in your case that you're not very used to it, so maybe it's a first step. How do you go about it? How can you begin? Well, there are many practical advice that one would give. I'm not going to try to give like all the different possibilities here. It is very much advised maybe sometimes to read something or uh, ask for advice so that you can talk. But some ideas that are maybe more for our prayer. And I've already highlighted the fact that it's something beautiful. Just like the sacra sacrament of confession is something very beautiful. In the beginning of the meditation I mentioned that as a priest you sit, one sits a lot in the confessional, listening, hearing all kinds of people, especially if you're in a church, in a parish, well, all kinds of people come. And it is quite impressive. It's quite impressive. Sometimes you realize that there are people who do not really know how to prepare. And then if you're the priest on the other side, well, you try to help a little bit, but <laughs> maybe you're not able to do that much, just on the spot. But we want to learn to clean well, because, of course, like in physical cleaning of a house, of course, it becomes cleaner if you know what to do, if you know what instruments to use. Just the other day, we were spending a few days in the, in the country with a few teenagers or kind of young, uh, young children. And um, after the two days, the idea was to clean up a bit. And uh, <laughs> one thing you realize quickly is that many children have no idea how to clean. <laughs> so, like, you can tell them to sweep or something here, but you go afterwards and you have to do the job yourself because <laughs> they, they haven't learned. And it's not their fault. It's just that no one has taught them you ask them to, to maybe swipe the table with a cloth and, and they leave 90% of the stuff <laughs> <laughs> on the table. Well, in the spiritual life, it can happen to us also that we haven't learned, that we don't notice, we don't realize. Pope Francis, many years ago, he wrote this book, the name of God is mercy, or God's name is mercy. It, it's a beautiful book. It's really an interview with, uh, with, a, with a journalist. And, and the book discusses God's mercy and the works of mercy and quite a lot about confession. And, and one question that the journalist asks is then, what, what advice do you give to people who feel that, well, they always, they don't know what to say in the confession, or they, they always confess the same things. And he gives some different points for, for that question, but one, one thing he says is that um, if, you, if you don't know what to confess, maybe it is that you have not learned. There are many things that you don't realize, that you're not aware of. And <clears throat> one might somehow think that, well, it's good for me not to notice, you know, like, then I don't have to worry about them. But of course, 
that would be like uh, like leaving the, the in, in on the floor and so on, leaving stuff and like, oh I don't want to see, I don't want to see. <laughs> but, but then but the stuff is still there. And maybe it smells bad and all kinds <laughs> of things. And, and then I'm wondering, I wonder if it why it's so unpleasant here. What is it because there's that there's that milk that you poured three months ago <laughs> or something, I don't know. I mean, it's a silly comparison, but when we learn to examine ourselves well, we end up becoming much cleaner. And, and God's grace can pour in, that light can pour in more plentifully. And as a result, we find ourselves with a lot more peace and joy. Let's never be afraid of our weaknesses and our imperfections and our sins, but rather let's trust that good God that we have, that God that we have learned to know in the person of Jesus Christ, who is infinitely merciful and always designed to help us, to forgive us, to clean our hearts. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> this topic of uh, examination of conscience and conversion is very, very important. In particular, there's one psalm known as the Miserere psalm, Psalm 51, which is a penitential psalm. It is uh, a psalm that is specially related to David, King David, who, who seems to have written many of the, of the Psalms, and it expresses his desire for conversion after his great sin. And we have some beautiful words there. It's not just penitential in the sense that, oh, poor me, poor me, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Yes, that's part of it. He, he begins by saying, have mercy on me, O God, according to thy steadfast love. Steadfast love or mercy, your faithful love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. So it begins by that acknowledgement of, of real sin that King David was aware of. And it's good that we are also aware of our real sins, sometimes, like big sins. You don't have to be murderers or something like that in order to, to have real contrition for, for our sins. Sometimes, especially sins that are not so great outward, but inwardly, like pride and lack of gratitude, things that in themselves are really worth contrition. But then the psalm prays very beautifully. It says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. And I'll continue, but let me just comment on this. There's a great point here, which is that what God desires for us is not some kind of outward perfection, like outwardly appearing perfect before the eyes of other people. God desires truth in us. And Lord, I also want, and I ask you for that grace to desire truth in my inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Teach me wisdom. And the psalm continues, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Do you realize what a beautiful point this is? That that contrition that uh, David had, and that and the, the scriptures meant for our prayer also, it's not meant to remain kind of lamentation, but it moves, encouraged by God's grace, it moves towards that trust that God, you are able to, to clean me, 
I find often these mistakes and weaknesses and concrete sins in my heart, but I trust that you're able to clean me so that I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be white as snow. And then fill me with joy and gladness. Let the bones which thou hast broken rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and steadfast spirit within me. Those are great petitions, great things to ask God from Lord, Lord Jesus, create in me a clean heart, put a new and steadfast spirit within me. That is, renew me interiorly. And I ask you to do it every day. Every day it is good to do some kind of examination of conscience, at least a little bit, two or three minutes maybe at the end of the day, looking back on the day and seeing, well, how has this day been? There have been lights and there have been shadows, there have been things to be grateful for, and there have been things to, to repent. And then, for the, for the latter, I ask you, Lord, to clean me and renew me with your grace. And, and finally, the psalm says also, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a willing spirit. Well, it still continues, but those that central part is a very beautiful prayer for our prayer also. Let's take advantage of those beautiful um, riches of scripture for our own prayer. Now, I mentioned that examination of conscience is something that we must learn. And we have just a few minutes left for our, for our meditation. And I want to highlight just, uh, just really two points. If, of course, if you don't know how to examine your conscience, but you would uh, want to, there may be two things that can help. On the one hand, maybe finding some text in English and many other languages, there are many uh, resources on the internet that you put, if you type examination of conscience, you find hundreds of pages of <laughs> different, very good ones. Many of them follow the Ten Commandments, but they help you to kind of notice more concrete things that are not just, you know, not just with the, you are a murderer, but also <laughs> many kind of concrete things that, of, that ordinary sinners like you and me can do. And but the other thing is that um, it's just to learn to be a moment in silence, in God's presence, asking God, give me a grace, help me to see what you would like me to see. I think it's a very good way of examining our conscience, saying to God, help me to see what you would like me to see today. Like in the beginning of this meditation, we considered how examination of conscience is like that opening the window so that light comes in. But maybe in this moment, we're not ready to see everything that is in the room. And God doesn't necessarily want us to see everything. Maybe there's one or two things that he would encourage us, that he would like us to notice first, so that they can be cleaned up. And it is a normal process that as we advance in our, in our communion with God and in our spiritual life, we begin to notice new things along the way. 
And that's why many saints have felt themselves to be great sinners. Maybe we feel that, well, I'm not a great sinner, you know, I'm just a little bit a sinner, kind of <laughs> tiny bit sinner. And it's paradoxical that many saints have considered themselves like very great sinners. And, and the explanation is simply this. As this one author says, by their correspondence with grace, they have opened wide the windows of their soul to the light of God. They have known how beneficial and necessary it is to examine well the whole rule. And they have learned to notice many things that we don't maybe notice. But let's have the courage, that humility of sincerely saying to God, Lord, help me to notice those things that you would want me to notice now. And to finish, one point about uh, looking forward. Because what if we, just like with the cleaning comparison, we tend to find that we need to clean up again. And in the spiritual life, this may mean that we get discouraged because Maybe in the natural life, like in the physical life, we, we can more easily accept the fact that, well, dirt just accumulates. But in a spiritual life, in a moral life, we're maybe more easily inclined to pride, thinking that, well, I should be ready, you know. I should not have to have these same defects again and again. Lord, why do I always have the same difficulties, you know? Why am I always so proud? Why am I always so selfish? Or again, I have been looking for my comfort and so on. And how should we react to that? Good news, you're a human being. Like, <laughs> welcome to the real world. You are not an angel. Uh, you're, you are not, you know, you're just like everyone else. So, don't be troubled by that. Nevertheless, take the next step from humility passing to concreteness, from humility passing to decisions, effort, struggle. Struggle not so that, not for the purpose of somehow with a great, great, great effort in a couple of days, in a couple of weeks, so that this problem would be completely resolved. No, but through that effort, showing that I love, that I want to, that I want to do God's will, that I want to make myself a good dwelling place, dwelling place for God. I think it's a very helpful idea to say, and this is something that Saint Jose Maria used to say often, that um, that struggle is love. Meaning, if you make an effort, it means that you love. Even if you many times fail, even if you find yourself with the same defects until the end of your life. Like someone said, there are many problems in life that are not resolved but they are managed. And that's mostly the case with our defects. That may be also expressed in terms of divine filiation, and with this we finish, that we are like little children. God's little children who quite naturally often fall or stumble or get themselves dirty, but they get up again, and again, and again. And then they fall, and they get up again. And then they fall, and they get up again. The important thing is that they don't stay lying on the floor, or on the, in the mud uh, pool, but they get up, and they continue. And what children do, 
Well, little children especially go to their mother. They go to their mother like we go to the Blessed Virgin Mary, who always picks us up also. And she doesn't mind that we are full of dirt and mud and all kinds of stuff. Maybe she sometimes says, ooh, let's go quickly and <laughs> take you to wash because you are all completely muddy. Mm -hmm. But she is a mother. And uh, she makes it so much easier for us to be full of hope, never to be afraid of our, of our sins, because even before we go to Jesus, even before we are able to express our defects, well, she has already embraced us and carried us a good way towards God. I give you thanks, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this time of prayer. I ask you for help to put them into effect. My Mother Immaculate, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. <laughs>